I just, you know, being kind of cool. Well, if went over it day after day, that's before they had stars. Lead the way, Habershack. You're related there. Yeah. Mike did a lot of work there. I know what it looks like. Yep. I'm coming. What was sure, Bob? Oh, I'm with you. Something there, guys. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm actually taking video too. You and both. My first time here. Oh. Thank you, though. Take a picture of Mike.
Oh, it's right here. I'm guessing with the flowers. like me when I was young. And I had hair. <laughs> yeah, it looks like you. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. He's yep. the grandson of oh. uh, the one yep. standing at the back. Yep. I remember going in there, too. Yeah, they were kids. They weren't supposed to. Okay, we'll get started. I know you're all shivering. <coughs> now that we survived the first part of our Survivor show here, it's downhill, but uphill is going to be the second part. Okay, we're here at the Foster Tunnel Number 2. It's named after Asa Lansford Foster. Lansford's name comes from him. He was a mercantile man for the coal company in Muck Chunk, who later went to his own business and he could make it for somebody, he made it for himself. And he got a lease from the coal company for this, I believe it was in the 1840s, 1850s. And one thing that was important, we had the switchback, there's trails up above us and in front of us for the loaded and empty cars that were taken up to Summit Hill and shipped out, out of the valley here. Basically, they didn't have a breaker in later years. It was shipped on the Loki Road behind Foster Avenue and the Houses and Seek to the number 11 Ron Colry. And this is actually part of Ron Colry. It was included in that. You saw any of the mind maps up there. That's the early history. Now we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. And you notice we put it so everybody could see it. <coughs> that looks really good. Oh. And it is original, 48 stars. That's the flag that was in use at the time in 1915. The president was Wilson, who cried when he saw some of his soldiers that had to go overseas and serve. 
because that was before us getting involved in the war. So we do have a history with that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And that's part of people paint on pallets. That's actually a pallet, but it, every inch of it has boards. So it was incorporated, and we drug it up there this morning. And it, believe me, it's a hard course. Okay. Why well, we're here is very important in the lives of many. And others couldn't care about it. But 100 years ago, from September 27th through October 3rd, 1915, 11 miners were trapped underground here for six days. Their day started off early. Like any other day, it was early, it was, fall was just starting. 11 o'clock, the miners were in there, they fired a shot. Next thing you know, water broke through. And I mean so much water, it came out the front, as it's doing now. It shot out with vengeance and force. What happened, they were in the bottom split of the East Mammoth vein, when the top from the top split broke through. The rock strata was getting weak because the vein was in fault and it was pinching. They never knew that. As a result, millions of gallons of water came shooting down there. It devastated anywhere from two to three hundred feet of chutes, coal, timber, you name it, everything, all hell broke loose on those guys. Now you could imagine, it would uh, in the 1970s, up at Porter Tunnel, water broke through. It shot the mine cars right out of the tunnel. And this is no exception to that. Where it, the accident happened was about 1,200 feet in and another 1,300 feet probably over towards Springdale. How, now, there was, here's an amazing thing. We talk about how fast we are with computers. In 1915, the accident happened at 11 o'clock in the morning. It was in the newspapers and printed that very day on the 27th. By the second day, people were giving up hope. You know why? They couldn't hear anything from these trapped miners. They couldn't hear any noises. They figured, well, they're done, they're drowned. I had a friend that drowned in a mine when water broke through like that. So it's, it would be given that, yes, they're gone. And with the timbers and the mud and everything, if you notice, the rock around here is very fractured. And what on top of it, they were robbing out pillars in, in what was left. This is just the water level because basically there's no coal left in it. Any other coal underneath would be taken from number 8, number 9, number 10, and number 11. They could crisscross and get the coal that would remain. So by the second day, even the relatives were given up hope. And it, uh, but the, the mine superintendent, Wilden, had the belief, and so did the coal company officials, that they're alive. So they kept digging and digging. They came up with a plan. They would go in where it was caved and clear out five, seat, five feet of rubble on the right-hand side. Behind them was another crew that would open up the whole tunnel. Above them in the monkey, which is like a parallel highway, above the the, the uh, gangway would be another 50 guys hand by hand taking out debris. They would work in four hour shifts and be relieved, relieved in and out because it was very strenuous. And at all times outside here was a rescue team with those oxygen masks and everything, even 100 years ago, to go in there if they ran into gas or whatever because gas was a possibility. Where you have coal, it's a decayed vegetable matter. It gives off methane. You, you can't smoke in our mines because uh, open flame could explode them. However, like in a zinc mine and all, nobody cares. Smoke all you want, they don't, it, it won't explode. So this crew went on day after day. They found some signs, but then they found no signs. And then finally they heard somebody rapping, I guess because they must have heard the shovels coming through the, the muck and all, yep. scraping and, and whatever. So finally there was hope. Then we're dealing with something called a race against time. You have water, you could have gas, 
You could have people starving, people injured, and whatever. Hypothermia could set in. You gotta remember, they were in a flood. They're frozen. So they crawl up in this one chute. I think it was chute 27 is where they stayed, basically in one group. Some guys slept. One guy said, I didn't sleep. He just kept bouncing around. Well, I guess when the Grim Reaper is going to be knocking on your door, you're not going to sleep either. Because anything could happen at any minute. And they also faced the possibility that more could be coming and caving in and suffocate them or whatever. Now, with these guys were four faithful mules. These mules survived the initial onslaught of all this. However, eventually one got crushed with falling timbers or whatever, and three other ones, as they were roaming around the gangways, were drowned. They either got in a predicament, got tangled, or more water broke in. So they were faithful friends to the very end with the miners. And even to escape, to get up into one chute, in the articles, they actually stood on the back of the one mule to get up. That's the kind of friend those mules were. And it's an outstanding thing that they had to lose their lives because any animal like that is like a, a fellow miner or whatever, especially if you give chew tobacco or you give him an apple. He's your friend forever. But uh, the amazing thing, we're modern, but we weren't modern. If you look, Bobby over here is dressed with the, Bobby, if you want to turn around, with the oil light, and he has a, a canvas hat on. Some of them had a leather peak. This was your flashlight for in the mines. Not very effective, it's like holding a candle. Then when you bent over your head, the hot oil had a tendency to run down your face or, or on your hands. One thing that helped save the guys inside, they had a more modern one. It was a little bit shorter and it had a double spout because it would be filled with like paraffin, like canning jar wax, and they would put that in. It was much cleaner and it wouldn't, pour out. It would just vaporize as up to wick as it was needed. Eventually, the extra miners' sunshine, as they call it, they had sunshine and they had moonshine wax, different trade names. They were eating it to stay alive. Now, if you want to eat wax, maybe those little soda bottles when we were a kid, <laughs> that's, not, that's not very tasty, okay? On top of it, they were thirsty. And you know what kind of water comes in there? Alum water, okay? Some of them drank it. They would throw up, of course. It's repulsive. But in the desperation, you're gonna do a lot of things. One shining point, a miner never throws away food or water until he's out of that mine. I believe it was a bonner had, his whole lunch can was filled with food, chicken and everything else. So they lived off of that for a couple days. They even mashed up the bones for, for a meal. And sometimes, in desperation, people start chewing leather belts or anything like that. Starvation, cold, in the dark. And these, they had these oil lights, and they burned pretty long. So if there were 11 guys, you could have 11 lights, and you only need one maybe at the most. And they had matches they kept in a steel can. And uh, those matches lasted them up until about the day before the last day when they were rescued. So that at least they had light. And the amazing thing, on the second day, two guys come walking out. They were in there searching around. You know, <laughs> miners have instincts, and you, what, you have no hope unless you're going to do something. You stay there waiting for rescue. It's not going to happen necessarily. We see miners out west and all around the world, trapped forever and gone. But at least these guys tried, and two of them came out. Watkins and Hollywood. They're the ones that put the shot off, that brought in the water, but they were managed to, to get out. And then later on, another guy, a couple days later, would be coming out. So one heck of a, a thing. You don't realize there were three ambulances here waiting over there, I was told they had the body bags with the tie ropes. They were canvas at that time, ready to go. They expected the worst, the coal company, they had to be prepared. And one thing people don't realize, there were tents, there were people from all over here. 
And the last day of the rescue, how many people do you think were down here when they were rescued? 5,000 people. They must have devastated Lansford, Coldell, <laughs> Nesco, 5,000. But you got to realize, it's reality TV. This was the only show in town. Everybody was going to it. You wouldn't want to miss something like this. It's fantastic. So these guys went through, I would say, trial by fire. They had memories that would last them a lifetime. Incredible memories. And if you were trapped like that, imagine, way in the mountain, you have hope. You don't have hope from one minute to the next. And how, how many people go without a meal for a day? How about six days? You're getting a little meager ration. So it's very, very difficult. So finally, when, and the funny part was, when the ultimate rescue happened, the superintendent, who was newly appointed for the whole district, Mr. Wilden, he was in there. After they recovered the mine, he collapsed. He was that exhausted. Then he went home and he collapsed a couple more times. The pressure was so, in, he was a new superintendent. You don't want to lose men on your watch. One man's important, but when you lose losing 11 guys, you don't want that ever to happen. They take it, it's family, it's people. And uh, if you have caring people, they worry about somebody else. So it's an incredible story. And you don't realize it went around the world. Every kind of newspaper carried it. Just the same as when the Shepton Mine disaster happened. It has worldwide things. And you know, Foster's has always been special. And I'm down here in solitude working a lot of times. Believe me, you know, 100 years after nature, you should see what it looked like before. You couldn't even stand here. As a result, I said, what makes this area so special? You realize the little water that goes, this is alum in here, but nature really purifies it. Things are over it and all, it acts as a filter and binds it and keeps it from going into the water. But the water from here goes into the Panther Creek, into the Little Schuylkill, into the Big Schuylkill at Port Clinton, down to Philadelphia, and into the Delaware Bay, which goes where? The North Atlantic. We have a worldwide connection here that we never knew about. It's absolutely amazing. It's like some kind of magic. And one thing, you see the pillars over here. We have a picture. These are believed to be the survivors. There are seven of them who came back to work. And I believe it was taken somewhere over this area. They had an air door that would actually up on pulley up above them. And the way it looked, there's a fan house up here in the mountain. And the, that door is typical where you're losing air. So every once in a while, that door would have to come down and shut because they're forcing in ventilation. But these are believed, I could recognize two of the guys on here as being the people that were in there. And the amazing thing is, we're at the Ron Gun Club, right? This guy was doing a promo. He was acting like he was fishing in the stream here <laughs> <laughs> with, with a stick. So, so, sense of humor, even then. And that now, you've got to realize, these guys, a lot of them went back to work. Watkins, who it was his last week to work in there, was going to become a chicken farmer down Mahoney. He should have quit sooner, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but they were all characters in their own right. And I think it was a defining moment in the character of the people of Coldell and the Panther Valley as what can be done as a team. Every individual was very important. We cared. We knew who everybody was. So this, this is a great thing because two years ago I had a mine disaster program. 21 people died. Nobody came out alive. Here we have the complete opposite. Lives were saved, lives were lived and went on. Mr. Lohinitz died in 1937. I knew, I talked to his, his daughter. He had problems, he was in mine acid in there. His legs, he suffered. He had to sit by the kitchen stove to get the circulation in them. So these guys paid a price, but 
Then again, they went on to become normal citizens, and some people I know in the audience are descended from these people. So without them continuing, it's a different story. And I'm glad that you're here to share with us today. And uh, I'd like to ask anybody here if they have any relatives or anybody involved that they would want to speak about and mention them. The Murphy family, come on. Don't be shy. What? You don't have anything to say, though. You don't yes, care. you do. <laughs> tell, tell them who your grandfather was. Joseph Peanuts Murphy. Peanuts Murphy Joseph was in there? Yeah. We don't really know anything, though. Um, my grandfather died when, I want to say 1959. I was five. My sister was a baby. So I have, and we would, we, my father couldn't find work, so we moved to Ohio for 10 years. When, when we moved back here, my father did work in the mines, so it's kind of what comes around again. Yep, and my father worked yeah. for the uh, Spazio brothers, and you know, he ends up with that's CNN. Really and yeah, thing, yeah, so he did come back and work in the mines, but I, we don't really know any stories about that. We just know that he was, he was in this, he's, he's this guy right there. Hmm. We were wondering from the picture if he's one of them, you yeah. know, that came back, but we couldn't recognize. We don't know. We I'm don't assuming know. he went back to We Oracle, think he did, but we don't really know that. And I'm going to see if I could get the police, state police forensics to compare facial features on that guy. <laughs> because that, I, I'm, I could just about see them, but they're a different pose. This was the pose taken October 9th when they were taken to the Goldell or the Panther Creek Valley Hospital at that time. And this is the day most of them were released. One or two had to stay behind because they weren't healthy yet. They, they were rescued October 3rd, and this was taken October 9th by Bailey Studios in Tamaqua, up on the front of the Old Panther Creek Hospital. So, and this is the icon image that everybody knows and remembers. And you'll get to eat part of it on the cake up there. <laughs> when they got out of the hospital, they all got new suits from the company, right? All yeah, them, they made too. sure that they were presentable right. and they were pretty spiffy for them. <laughs> <laughs> but you realize, and they did pay them, you know, for being trapped in there. They paid them a wage. It wasn't much, but they did pay them their regular working wage. Well, you're on the property, so you were doing something. <laughs> but there was no expense, I must say this, spared by the coal company to rescue these guys. Money was no object. And they had some of the best mining men here in the valley. So if they couldn't do it, nobody else could. But they always had faith that they'd be rescued. A lot of people didn't. Even their relatives gave up on them. But that's the magic of life and hope. <coughs> Mr. Gursky, since we talked about the hospital. Okay, yeah. I just want to, I just want to thank... Mike for, for putting this together and, and inviting St. Luke's Miners Campus to be a part of this commemoration. And thank all of you for coming down today to, to remember this. Uh, make sure you talk about it and talk about the talking about it to your, to your friends and your family and your, your children and your grandchildren uh, because places like this are often forgotten about. Uh, events like this are often forgotten about. Next time you hear somebody tell you that they had a rough week at work, remind them of the positive mine, mine disaster and the, and, the, and the 11 men who had the roughest week at work and also remind them of the positive outcome that, that came out of, out of, out of this incident. Uh, this, the St. Luke's Miners Campus is located just a few hundred yards from here and in 1905 when the United Mine Workers uh, started an effort to build their own hospital uh, they worked with Dr. Schifferstein who was a, a, a local physician who also practiced at the Ashland Hospital and he knew there was a lot of working men uh, from this valley who ended up having to go over what is today a 45 minute drive. I can't imagine how long it took back back in then. Uh, so in 19, 1905 they started an effort. It took five years to raise the money. The miners of this valley donated a day's wage. The coal company matched that donation and donated the land where the, the hospital is located today. Churches and civic organizations and businesses all, all contributed to build, build a, a, a miners hospital. Uh, it was, was built in 1910, opened the doors in July of 1910, and they, and they picked a location 
uh, for, for a reason. This was before the time of interstates. Hospitals today are put along interstates. This was a pedestrian community. People walk to work, they walk to church, and they walk to their doctor's offices or the hospital. So they put it where it was needed most. And boy, five years later, uh, in 1915, it was needed when they pulled the men out of the mine and they needed care right away. Uh, we've, been, we've been following that same mission since 1910 taking care of the local men and women, the working people of this valley and our, our greater community. Uh, of course, we do it a little bit differently than we did it back then. The hospital that, that stands there now was built in 1973. Uh, we love the picture of the miners on, on the original Panther Valley Creek Hospital uh, and we're really proud to be part of that tradition and, and, and this, this commemorative event. Uh, we do it a little bit differently now, but we still have a pulmonary rehab clinic. Uh, we still have, we always had a black lung clinic. We still have a pulmonary, uh, a, a big pulmonary department at, at the Miners Hospital. Uh, we we still keep the Miners name uh, on our Miners campus. If you if you're familiar with any of the other St. Luke's hospitals, we have we have six hospitals and we're building a seventh. Uh, they they're named after the location where they are. We're named after the Miners, and we're very proud of that. We're very proud to carry that tradition. Um, and if you come into our lobby, you'll see that we still pay homage to the, to the reason that we're here, which is the hard work of the women of this valley. So appreciate you putting this together. It really is important that we take the time um, and, and, and remember these events and to do it appropriately. So thank you very much. Thank you. We have a guest of honor here. Guest of honor. The grandson of the last survivor from the Foster's that Tunnel. That. That okay. was, he was up far right <laughs> rear. Hey, this good looking point. guy here. Yep. What well, happened? That looks like me when I was young <laughs> and had hair. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, Joe Lagon. And for me, this was something that was family history. Back from the earliest days I can remember, somewhere back around three or four, I can remember the earliest when he was telling me about the stories about the mining accident, about being in here, about how cold and how horrible it was, and the alternating hope and despair that uh, seemed to come every day. It was actually only the day before they were rescued that they started hearing the sounds in there that told them that they had real hope and they had something else other than what they carried inside to give them hope. And they saw the possibility that hey, we might get out of this. And uh, it was a uh, very moving experience when it finally opened up and they pulled, uh, pulled them out, took them straight to the hospital, as a matter of fact, from here, uh, took them out on a stretcher. But uh, it was the longest six days of Grandpap's Life. I can remember, as a matter of fact, when he brought us down here, I used to come down with uh, my friends and Grandpa used to take us around uh, all of these areas and regale us with all sorts of stories from the days. He was one of the ones that went back two months afterward and he did work until this particular mine closed. After that, uh, attended to the mom and pop store that he and Brad had down at uh, Phillips Street. But he used to come out, take us here, and uh, showed us this. And naturally, when he wasn't around, we came back by ourselves with flashlights and went in the mine and uh, went pretty far doing some exploring, which is very thin. It seemed pretty far when I was a kid, but things looked bigger. And uh, yeah, it was dirty. The, uh, uh, sulfur alum water was a lot uh, more opaque and yellow back in those days than it is right now. But uh, it, it was fascinating from there as well as from the fan house that I hear has been unfortunately taken apart by souvenir hunters now. But uh, that was their source of air when they were down in the mines. Big, huge fan. It was about 14 foot in diameter, if I'm not mistaken. I used to whirl around and send air down and into the mine because that carried it around. And the same thing, they knew they had limited air when they were trapped in there. They didn't know if they had a source of air coming in, and so it wasn't only the uh, possibility of the black damp uh, and explosion down there, there was also the possibility of using up the oxygen and finding it much harder to breathe, which is why they kept the light down as much as they can. 
and they wanted to preserve the moonshine, as you mentioned, the video. at the end. It was pretty horrible. Had at least a little bit of uh, hydrocarbon. But uh, this was something that I heard of from my earliest years, carried all the way through, and Grandpa died in 68, uh, and was the last uh, survivor in my nation. And uh, in telling me about the stories, that was why he was my first and greatest hero, because of what they went through. And, uh, it was one of two very, very bad episodes that he had uh, in his life. Second was five years later, but it's a whole different uh, private episode. But this almost took him away after the uh, mining incident and feelings of mortality. He married Grandma and uh, they set about to starting a family, first with Uncle Billy and then with my, uh, my father was raised, and uh, Grandpap and his brother William came over from Lithuania with minimal education and were coal miners and settled here. They came where they wanted to be. And yet uh, his son, my father, became a doctor. William's son, Albert, became a doctor. Uh, and uh, eventually I came. But uh, he told us lots. He told me a lot of stories, not just about the mining accident, but about the aftermath and how it was afterward. The difficulty of going back in that cave again after having been trapped there for six days without any guarantee of getting out, and yet they had the guts to go down and do it and go back to work. And uh, that's why he was my hero. A special presentation that you want to take care of. Oh, yeah. This is for all the miners. And uh, a wreath in red, white, and blue. Uh, these people, most of them were uh, immigrants, but they were very American and pro American, which is why we have the red, white, and blue. They came to America because they wanted to be here. Their families ended up the way they did because of the country and the way it is here. And so this seemed appropriate. And they all lived. Thank you. On behalf of the miners. <laughs> Doctor, I just want to also say, uh, I'm George Halkovich, one of the Schuylkill County Commissioners. But when you, when you talk about... I, I go to Lithuania. I've been there four times ah. in the past two years, in Vilnius, Kaunas, Mariupol. But yeah, when you talk, I, I come from Lithuanian background, but oh, also yeah. an Irish background also. And we had the Lithuanian ambassador to the United States here in Schuylkill County. And one of the things that he said, and it's interesting, about the Irish and about the Lithuanians, he says, they're fighters. They're strong. Oh, yeah. Okay? You want to have somebody there that has that strength. But one of the things that the Lithuanian ambassador said to me, and it's very much part of this area, that he wants to take back to Lithuania now is the heart. He said, Irish Americans, Polish Americans, Lithuanians, they have heart. And that's one of the things about this community. Uh, I, I was telling him that my grandfather was chief electrician at the Lytle when the Lytle had their disaster also and uh, when you talk about hard workers you talk about a work ethic that's one of the things that our area has the Panther Valley area Carbon County Schuylkill County you have real workers and people who care but the ba the main thing I think it gets you through all that also is your faith because the faith of the people here is, is second to none <coughs> so I just want to thank you for everything you've done this is such a great tribute to what you're doing here and God bless Thank you. You're welcome. I have to say, uh, as a matter of fact, I am Polish Lithuanian. There you go. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was also a miner over in Shenandoah, Zabolewski. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, he was also in a mining accident, which ended up crippling him and eventually did uh, some of the uh, problems that were caused, uh, cost him his life. Wow. And, uh, but yeah, I'm from both the Polish and Lithuanian and from coal miners. As I say, Achu. On both sides. Achu and Prosho. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Very good. Indeed. Thank you. Okay, we'll call upon Reverend Jeremy Benick for some prayer. First of all, I'd like to thank you for having me come, uh, be able to participate in this. Uh, my grandfather also uh, lived in Coldale his whole life. Didn't work here, but worked at number nine. And uh, my grandmother would always say, whenever the whistle blow, everyone's hearts would drop. And I could only imagine how everyone felt, you know, when uh, the accident took place here. So, but there was a lot of talk of faith and hope. And scripture is very clear that with God, all things are possible. And so uh, we'll take this time just to, uh, to look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come and first off, we just thank you because you had your hand of protection upon these uh, these miners and uh, Father, with uh, uh, with your your mercy and grace upon them, Lord God, we thank you that uh, you worked within uh, the people's uh, lives to to come and and uh, and find find them safe and to be able to bring them out. And Lord, it, it reminds us so much of again the the care. A lot of these miners, we know that they went in here and did these hard jobs because, mainly because of their love for their families and support their families. And uh, Father, we, we thank you that in this community, especially this Panther Valley area and the areas around, uh, Lord God, that when difficulty circumstances come or tragedies or hardships, that you see, see our, our families come together, Lord God, to, to lift each other up and to do whatever it takes to help either bring healing or, or find hope or to, to help in whatever situation may be going on. So Father, I just pray that you continually work within uh, the families within our valley and within our communities for hope and faith within our communities to, to, to allow us to be people who, who love each other and people that help each other and know each other and we pray, Lord, that stories like this would be experiences that would be passed along so that we don't forget the importance of looking out for each other and the importance of faith and hope in our everyday lives. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, if there's anything you take out of here, it should be never give up hope. Never give up hope that you'll reach the top of that hill on the way back. <laughs> I thank everybody for participating. We're going to party up there. And uh, if you want to take pictures down here yet and whatever, feel free. Because I think we take time out for some things that mean something to each and every one of us in life. You can't put a price tag on it. It's something right. You, you know it should be done, and you do it. And that's the way I felt for a long time. I was going to do something to celebrate this event. A hundred years, I think this was a defining moment in Coldwell's history in the Panther Valley. And so we took it back from nature. Check another hundred years from now. Nature will take us back, but <laughs> such is life. And remember, enjoy each moment because you never know when the last are going to happen. Don't put off what, have memories, not regrets. Do the things you want now. Okay, we could proceed up.